Today, the flag of the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico waves proudly beside Old Glory. March 2, 1917 was the centennial of the extension of uh, citizenship to Puerto Rico under the Jones Act. That means for over 100 years, uh, Puerto Ricans as a whole have been citizens of the United States. It means that the fortunes of Puerto Rico have been tied in with the fortunes of the United States for over a century. We're celebrating or commemorating or denouncing, whatever your point of view is, the 100th anniversary of a law that Congress passed in 1917. So the Jones Act is a collective naturalization statute that was enacted in 1917 to essentially grant citizenship to Puerto Rico. So we're talking about a significant milestone in the history of the relationship between Puerto Rico and the United States. It's coming at an incredibly important time for Puerto Rico, given everything else is going on in the island happening now, but also in the last two years. So the crisis is really important because it highlights three points. One is the unequal access to federal uh, funds. So because Puerto Rico is an unincorporated territory, our, all block grants financing health, education, and essentially all facets of the island are blocked or capped. That means that U.S. citizens living in Puerto Rico do not have the same access to the resources that are available to U.S. citizens in the mainland. We grow up very, very proud of who we are, particularly because I think we're in an identity crisis. I feel like uh, our status right, and our history with the United States is very complex and confusing, particularly when you're, when you're born and raised here uh, in the United States, or even just raised here. Uh, and so, you know, we, we are very proud people, and I, and I feel like we have that deep connection, right, to the, for, to the island. And, and because we have this complex and interesting relationship to the U.S., and we're also very proud to be Americans, we're very proud to have that citizenship, and we understand what it means, right, globally, uh, in a global economy, right, um, and so and, and what it represents as far as political freedom. Uh, so, so I think we're proud of both of those histories, and so in the end, we are one people. We really are one people because of that complex history. So the, the contention right now is that the status of Puerto Rico has not been resolved and there's a plebiscite coming up on June 11. The statehood party is arguing that if Puerto Rico votes for independence, they stand a chance to lose their citizenship should Puerto Rico become independent. There was, uh, among many, uh, the imagined possibility of eventual independence for the island, you know, sort of a path towards sovereignty, and that just never happened. Um, and so what we've had since then is a lot of, you know, divided interests about what would be best for the island's future. And all of that is all up on the table again, right now at a time of great uncertainty. Advocates of independence don't care that much because they see U.S. citizenship as an imposition, as a colonial imposition. But upwards of 90% of the population in Puerto Rico and in the U.S. would like to retain their citizenship as part of their sort of social, economic, political livelihoods. In other words, Puerto Ricans in the island usually have links to persons in the United States, and they have ties to the U.S. government and to the United States. They receive Social Security, they receive some benefits that are afforded to U.S. citizens. So in that sense, there's a lot of contention about what could happen with citizenship should the status change. The question is, if Puerto Rico were to become independent, what would happen that moment on, let's say next year Puerto Rico is declared uh, a republic, would people in Puerto Rico lose their citizenship? The answer that Charlie is given is no. They are born in the U.S. for citizenship purpose. They cannot be taken back. The main thing is that a lot of people don't know the history of the extension of citizenship to Puerto Rico. And a lot of debates are framed on the sort of lack of knowledge or misunderstanding of the history. I guess that part of the uh, national myth uh, that we face is that Puerto Ricans uh, were um, given or invested with U.S. citizenship in 1917 so they could go uh, to France and die. Well, there's many uh, problems with that assertion. Uh, it is completely untrue. And let's start by the fact that Puerto Ricans did not need to be U.S. citizens to uh, be subjected to the draft or to volunteer and serve in the military. American nationals uh, were the ones who were required to register for the draft, and Puerto Ricans have been American nationals since 1900. Politically, nothing has changed since 1900. 
the status of Puerto Rico remains the same. Puerto Rico is an unincorporated territory. Now you have citizens who are integrated into different facets of society. They can travel to the United States and participate in local elections. They can acquire the same benefits of any U.S. citizen while residing in the United States. Legal benefits, socially and economically and politically, we're still talking about there are some uh, differences. If you reside in Puerto Rico, then your status is determined by the territorial status of the island, which is an unincorporated territory. So persons in Puerto Rico are barred from participating in politics in a meaningful way. They don't have the same access to the Bill of Rights. They don't have access to the same protections or financial benefits that U.S. citizens in the mainland would have. A recent U.S. Gov. U poll asked uh, how many people knew what the citizenship status of Puerto Ricans were, and 43% said had no idea, and 15% were unsure. So we're talking more than 50% of the population has no idea what is the citizenship status of Puerto Ricans. And you know, there's the formal citizenship, right? What's on your passport, and then what's where do we find the sense of belonging? And I think that we enjoy the civil liberties and political freedom, right, and economic opportunity that we get through U.S. citizenship, but we also continue to struggle with identity. What does that mean for Puerto Ricans here, and actually all people here? Because we, we have a, a long history of discriminating against people of color and people from different backgrounds, and we still struggle with that U.S. identity. What does that mean to be a citizen? I guess it is a good year, 2017, to start talking about what extending citizenship to the Puerto Ricans meant then and what it means now. The question becomes, well, you know, is there something that we can do to clarify the debates, to create a national conversation that might at least create a baseline for understanding what's actually happening and what's the story behind the Jones Act of 1917? The fact that we have a center for Puerto Rican studies is something that you can't get anywhere else. I'd say it's probably the most important research resource for anyone learning about the diaspora. The Centro pinpoints and expresses what Puerto Ricans are all about. And the journal is unique in that it is the only journal that publishes research articles on the Puerto Rican experience. It holds our history and protects it. And without Centro, all these materials would be in jeopardy. I think it's important to have the Puerto Rico Puerto Rican summits and conferences because it informs the community and talk about solutions that are needed and are happening to provide resources for the different issues that we engage with. It is a pleasure to welcome you to the Puerto Rico Puerto Rican New England Summit in the great city of Hollywood, where you will find some of the best Puerto Rican food in this area. I'm extremely excited to this historical moment for all of us residing in New England and beyond. This summit will allow us to come together as a community and as a people to have an in-depth understanding on the fiscal and humanitarian crisis taking place in Puerto Rico. Let's attempt to use this time together today to fully engage, network, and learn from one another in order to create the solutions that are necessary. Today we will hear what many are doing, already doing stateside, to give la bienvenida and putting supports in place so that the transition from living on the island to stateside is not as difficult as it was for those that came before us. It's important to have this conference because it's important to be able to raise consciousness en la comunidad puertorriqueña, la diáspora puertorriqueña, de dónde es que estamos, cuál es la situación de Puerto Rico y cómo nosotros como puertorriqueños en los Estados Unidos podemos influenciar esa situación para mejorarla. The Puerto Rican crisis is a complex problem that has evolved over many years and it's not easy to understand. So conferences like this bring some clarity and information about what's going on. I should know more about Puerto Rico and the crisis and what's going on. And this is the opportunity to come and learn something that I think is valuable. Yo creo que estas conferencias son oportunidades donde líderes y personas que están haciendo trabajo por Puerto Rico o por comunidades puertorriqueñas en la diáspora tienen un espacio en común para compartir ideas intercambiar, conocerse y ver de qué manera pueden colaborar. Hay tantos temas que tratar y como hemos hablado, la llegada de muchas familias puertorriqueñas a esta área 
requiere que haya una respuesta organizada, una manera de lidiar con los, los retos de esas familias, sea en lo que sea, en la educación, en eh, servicios públicos, servicios sociales, este, vi, eh, vivienda, etc. It is important for the Puerto Rican community to organize and mobilize. More than ever, we have an untapped political power that we should get going. Every state where we have a footprint of Puerto Ricans is growing in population. Every state. Earlier today, uh, through Dr. Melendez's presentation, he highlighted the growing number of Puerto Ricans in Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island. The only uh, period in our history that compares to what we're undergoing now is back in the 50s, when the first wave of migration of Puerto Ricans migrants came to the U.S. That number will only continue to increase with the current economic crisis on the island. So with that and the political power that Puerto Ricans have within New England through elected positions, uh, it's, it's fitting that it's here in Massachusetts. It's fitting that it's here in Holyoke. Our population today is around 40,000 people. 47% of our city is Latino, mostly of Puerto Rican descent. And so when we're talking about progress in the public schools or housing development, we're seriously talking about the future and success of the Puerto Rican community here in the city of Holyoke. Puerto Ricans have been coming to New England for decades now. There's a vast Puerto Rican population that would benefit from learning about ways to organize and to organize politically to get things going for the community. And at the same time, those of us who are not from here, we can learn about local leaders. Es que la comunidad puertorriqueña de los Estados Unidos está regada, estamos muy dispersos. Entonces esto nos provee un, un espacio para llegar juntos como comunidad, conocernos, entender cuáles son los problemas y entonces empezar a organizarnos para crear acción. El primer punto de acción es unirnos. It is time for we as a community to come together to organize, to mobilize and to ensure that the community at large knows that Puerto Ricans are here and we are here to stay uh, and that we're going to unite for Puerto Rico and the issues that are impacting our community. Así que un día como hoy es importante no solamente para crear y levantar esa conciencia, pero también para tener ese llamado a la acción que nos ayude a crear un cambio positivo para la isla. This conference brings together Puerto Ricans from different parts of the United States and ties them to their Puerto Rican brethren on the island. So that then Puerto Rico is not just a place where you go to the beach, but actually a place that has issues, a place that has potential for growth, and a place that is more complex than we give it credit for. Para mí ser puertorriqueño significa tener orgullo de donde uno es. Y siendo puertorriqueño, igual que americano en esta, en esta cultura acá, me siento orgulloso de que tengo voz y voto en los asuntos que se tratan de desarrollo económico o, desarrollo, o educación, etc. Esos networks que se están creando, que yo estoy creando aquí, que creo con otras amistades, que vienen de Miami, de Chicago, de Connecticut, de diferentes áreas, fortalecen la comunidad puertorriqueña aún más y fortalecen las posibilidades de consenso político, cómo nos organizamos políticamente. Así que de, del centro no estar haciendo estas conferencias, tuviéramos una posición mucho más difícil a la hora de querer organizarnos como, como comunidad. I really like when I heard the word nomadic, which I heard today a few times to describe Puerto Rican because I think that's who we are. We do what we need to do, we go where we need to go so we can take care of our families. Centro is, is playing a critical role in, in the movement beyond just New York, you know, and New Yorkans. This is not just New Yorkans anymore. One of the things that a Centro has, it has the academic gravitas and authority to bring people from different sectors together in a way that other organizations could not. I'm very grateful for Centro because it has facilitated my involvement with the diaspora and my ability to take action and building from what we've done today and keep it going, you know, not just, just a one step kind of thing, making sure that um, we keep this going, we keep conferences going, we keep bringing awareness to what's going on, not only to like the academics, but people in the community, you know, opening up spaces so people in Holyoke who don't really have the opportunity to go to a college or a university or go to New York City and learn about what's going on can come to their high school that's like two, three blocks away and they can learn what's going on. The first story that I heard from my grandmother's lips, Teresa Martinez, 
has been my golden key in opening doors for me everywhere. It is just a fundamentally unique experience to read about characters that you can identify with. If you just read what she published, you would only have a fraction of a very skewed view of what she was writing. Thank goodness we have her archives here. Today is a great day for the Puerto Rican community. We're bringing together students, young leaders from throughout the country to have a conversation about what is it that we can do for Puerto Rico? You know, how can we structure internship opportunities? How can we do solidarity with Puerto Rico in a way that is effective? And that's very important because these young people are taking action in their campuses. They are. Uh, joining the cultural ambassador program where they learn about their heritage and their history. So there are great hopes among the leadership here about walking away with an agenda of action. We as Puerto Ricans, we have to get educated, we have to study, we have to become professionals, we have to become leaders from our fields. And that way we can make change. There's always a, a youth movement, so to speak. But what's different about this situation is that uh, we need leadership not just here in the diaspora, we, but we need to link the youth uh, leadership in the diaspora to Puerto Rico. So this is Paula. Paula studies in Florida. She's studying um, social media, public relations, social media, and music business. The icebreaker, I'm getting each student interview um, one person, and then they are the ones who are going to introduce the person they're interviewing. And she wants to like help the community and teach the community through art. The idea is to get them to talk to each other, learn about each other's interests. It's really about not learning from a teacher-student approach, but co-learning and building from um, the knowledge that they already have, because they are the experts in their own lives. It goes back to here, create more PRCs, right? Like, it, it, this doesn't have to have the connotation of PRCs. It could, it could be with existing organizations all, all, over there, right? So we're extremely excited to be co-hosting this event with um, Centro, the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, and we're gathering a uh, historic encuentro of Puerto Rican students and leaders from our own nation. We have people from California, Florida, Massachusetts, Puerto Rico, and New York City, all over. When Maria hit, I had those periods where like, yes, I, I, like, I cried, I mourned, but then I was like, we have to do something, because why am I here in the United States? and I'm not gonna do anything to help back home. One of my expectations was to get to know other activists and Puerto Rican students around the U.S. and in Puerto Rico that have been doing great things for the community, maybe getting more ideas from them about the work that I can do to get, get more involved. Would we only need one person at a time or can multiple people come to them? Today I expected to learn more about the differences in the cultures between my Californian and mixed Mexican, Dominican kind of side of things. But what I didn't expect and what I actually did learn was how much more they have to struggle here despite there being so many any um, Puerto Ricans, even from the island, that like are already here, they have to still fight just to be represented. I don't have access to this. Like, I don't know where to go. I don't know who to talk to. My expectation was how to like learn about like methods onto like community building and like how to be active in the community. Because right now I'm present in a community where there's little to no Puerto Ricans, and that's been a big struggle and impact on myself. So I wanted to learn ways that if I could um, talk to communities about being Puerto Ricans and like raise awareness or even meet other Puerto Ricans. We want to do something for a university, but sometimes we are not heard. My dad was talking about a, an encuentro and I thought it was a great opportunity to have a good perspective of what is happening here and in the diaspora because there are, even though we're Puerto Rican, there are different experiences, like challenges. So that's why like, I wanted to see what is happening here and get a, bit, a little bit more of knowledge of what is happening here and what can I obtain to help in Puerto Rico. How can we make engagement more accessible as better than second acting? I actually thought it was going to be more of like a, a teaching experience, but I actually like that it's more of like an interactive thing and it's like more hands-on and it's not like somebody's lecturing us. You know, they're asking us questions, we're asking them questions, we're all just getting to know each other. What I've gotten out of it is a lot of uh, facts about the economy that I wasn't entirely familiar with before. Like I had a basic background on it, but they like I did not expect them to get into the that detail that many details about it. 
I think the group is just magnificent. It's very diverse. We have people from the island that was raised in the island and they are now living in diaspora, like me. And we have people that were born in New York and now are living in Puerto Rico. A lot of exchange between the mainland and the United States. I was blessed to be awarded with the National Puerto Rican Day Parade Scholarship. <laughs> became a cultural ambassador two years ago. My expectation coming into today was just to meet a lot of great minds, right? It's exactly what I thought it was and even more. Like there's so many people here that like, that care about the same things that I care about and want, you know, the same things that I want and they can help me and I can help them. So like, I'm just so, I was so excited for that, I expected that and I'm getting more than that. So it's just great. Hopefully you've seen where we're going with this, right? There are many ways in which we have picked your curiosity. We're also planning to take this conversation to Puerto Rico and build that bridge of relationships that tie the Puerto Rican student movement in, in the United States to the changing reality in Puerto Rico, to economic reconstruction, to social entrepreneurship, and to internships that actually help them round up their education while at the same time contribute to the transformation of the island. He was able to pull people together. He was also one that did not focus solely on the Puerto Rican experience in New York, but made bridges to what was happening on the island, what was happening internationally. I, I think he got his power from being so rooted in the community. He changed the discourse. He made us talk about ourselves in broader terms. is a gathering of LGBT Puerto Ricans, which are lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender Puerto Ricans. And uh, it's the first time that we have convened a group of uh, LGBT uh, and pro-LGBT activists to strategize on what to do next. As the president of the Puerto Rican Day Parade, I remember so much controversy and conversations about whether gays were going to allow to participate in a parade or they were being excluded from a parade. And I said, you know what? In early in my tenure, we're going to table that conversation. It is no longer a conversation. This is about family. This is about giving people the freedom and the space to be their being, to be who they are. Because familia es familia, and amor es amor. La felicidad no es un pecado, mano. Y, y, y el amor es para todos. My community as a Puerto Rican man, as a gay man, is very important for me to support this. And I am so proud that finally we are able to march openly in the LGBT, uh, uh, as an LGBT contingent in the Puerto National Puerto Rican Day Parade. I think it's extremely helpful. I think it's extremely helpful, not just for the LGBT community, the fact that we are included as part of the diaspora and, and, and as part of the Puerto Rican community and accepted now, especially with the parade. This is history and groundbreaking. So hopefully today, they really, you know, these group could bring, because it's the first history we're doing this. So this is a, you know, this is a great accomplishment and we hope we can continue, not just today, but that the National Puerto Rican um, Parade, where I'm very grateful to them and Lorraine to, um, to, been, to do this and accept to do it in Centro. I'm very grateful to them and that they could continue doing it every year, that we could always have this discussion, bring many others, great speakers, panelists to express what they do, you know, so I'm, I'm honored to be one of the first here. Well, today at the Encuentro, we're looking in, uh, for, for uh, people to share their experiences, their, their thoughts, or where the lucha should go. We, uh, we want to know what are the next steps, what are the needs of our community, what are the voices that are out there, what are the resources that we have out there, and how we can harness all of that together towards a common goal, which is towards LGBT equality and also help Puerto Rico in its time of need. Well, I'm hoping that the conference achieves um, new solutions beyond uh, marriage equality. I do hope that what they take from this uh, conference is new ideas for advancement and uh, advancement for our community so that we can go even further and leave it the path a lot easier for the ones who are coming. We are all equal, no matter who we are. And you guys are opening the doors to that. You know, people are coming in to listen to the panelists, understand their stories. And that is what I've, I hope that this accomplishes, that you guys can spread the word beyond today. 
into the future in, in other areas as well. I think that it's, it's important that people understand that marriage equality is not the end of it all. We have so much to do still you know, to, to achieve that equality. And as I've always said, you know, equality is just the floor of the house that we're trying to build. Justice is the ceiling. So until, until, we, until we lay that foundation, we're, we're not there. So we have to continue to build uh, towards justice. And that's why we're at the Encuentro, to continue to build toward that, uh, that moment where we, we achieve full, full justice and equality. Yo creo que esto es un momento muy importante, eh, ¿verdad? Y, y estoy, eh, estoy bien emocionada de ver lo que sale de, de, de este encuentro. Eh, y yo creo que en un momento de crisis como el que estamos en la isla, ¿no? En donde las personas LGBT van a ser de las más vulnerables y las más afectadas por la crisis. No solamente los que viven en la isla, sino los que se están yendo, porque hay muchas personas que se están yendo no solo a Nueva York, pero también a otros estados como Texas, Florida, donde no hay hay protecciones para la comunidad LGBT plenamente, eh, que vamos a tener que seguir esta conversación y vamos a tener que ¿verdad? crear un plan eh, para, para poder eh, seguir eh, creciendo la lucha y para poder eh, seguir hermanándonos ¿no? con nuestra comunidad puertorriqueña, nuestra comunidad LGBT y lograr eh, resolver esta crisis. ¿no? El encuentro is part of a broader effort that the Center for Puerto Rican Studies is leading to, to build solidarity among the various sectors of our community, to say that we're developing a voice for Puerto Rico, but also for Puerto Ricans. The economic crisis in Puerto Rico has, uh, has a tremendous impact on Puerto Rican communities. Hey, Puerto Rico needs us more than ever. Uh, and after the Center for Puerto Rican Studies uh, convened uh, the summit for Puerto Rico, Puerto Ricans, uh, that it was a summit of the diaspora, uh, we decided during that summit that we would create this encuentro uh, to make sure that uh, we could bring together all the people that are working toward LGBT equality uh, to see how we can advance uh, that movement and, and you know, and further and build the agenda for what's next. So. The conference is precisely about finding those points of convergence, the, the, the issues that are really allow us to unify. And, and that's what I will call uh, uh, diaspora awakening, a movement of solidarity among Puerto Rican organizations, among Puerto Rican leaders that are not only uh, fighting for Puerto Rico, but also for Puerto Ricans and the problems that we face. El centro ha sido eh, bien eh, importante en que esta conversación se dé. Ahora también lo están documentando para confirmar eh, las contribuciones de la comunidad puertorriqueña LGBT, de las luchas y el trabajo que viene por ahí. Y por eso es importante que el centro se una a esa lucha y le damos las gracias. The fact that the centro is here and the fact that it, it is, it is uh, promoting uh, Puerto Rican awareness in our history that includes the LGBT cause. So I think in every facet available, the Centro is, is going to help not only us as Puerto Ricans, but people who, who, who want to, people who want to understand more about what we are, where we come from, uh, what we represent. I think the Centro is, is the perfect place for it. This is exactly what we wanted and, and more. Um, just to hear people that have been fighting for 60 years, you know, people that have been fighting for six months, but they're all coming together to just um, see what we're gonna do next. It's very important that we step to the plate and educate. It's our job to empower ourselves. Being an activist is not necessarily being as much vocal uh, as it would be being visible. It was great to be able to do this conference and this event today to bring people together uh, from the diaspora and beyond uh, to really talk about the need for equality and that the struggle's not over. You know, there may be marriage equality, uh, but there's many other battles uh, that face and confront the uh, LGBT community. So uh, there's a lot of work yet to do. It has been very, very moving uh, and uh, people are sharing their stories and sharing who they are and what they have been doing to better the lives of others. And you know, th this is what it's all about. So, so I'm happy. I'm a Rican. He finally my own way, my own way, anyway. Tato is one of the most important New Rican poets, but he's also a major poet. He truly captured the essence of so many people who walk the streets of New York that no one sees and no one listens to and no one knows. Give us your tire, your beating.
Tato has written his legacy with the poetry in his life. Esta experiencia nos ha marcado y nos ha llevado a, a un momento sumamente difícil. Bajo tordo tú no puedes criar a tu familia porque como quiera que sea se mojan, estamos incómodos, pasamos frío. Tenemos necesidad de que, pues, que a lo mejor pues no, no, como no estamos en la comunidad de un hogar, la vamos a seguir sufriendo. En el comedor había un mueble y empezó a tirar toda la cristalería y no podía pasar porque el movimiento era tan fuerte que y a oscura, no veía y aquí fue que me refugié. No sé si tú te has fijado que el, la tierra de aquí no ha dejado de, de temblar. Va a haber muchos casos de ansiedad y de depresión por las pérdidas de la gente. Hace como tres días hizo uno de 5.0. La casa se movía. Tenemos salud. Y podemos salir a ver. ¿Qué necesitas ahora? ¿Qué a psychologist. No, that's that's what I was going to tell you. Just yeah. talking to you now, I knew you. You have no idea. All I got is God. With the earthquake, the short beams cracked. So they lost residency twice already. So we have them living in one area in the back. When the earthquake happened, we had conversations with City Hall uh, to put together a, a team to go down and see what the needs are. Uh, our goal in emergency management is to make sure that uh, we're supporting the local uh, municipalities, the local uh, governments, to, and, and the local people to make sure that we can get the right resources to the right place. Every night they call me, Daddy, are you home? Daddy, are you home? I said, no, I'm still helping people out. And I want to show my kids if they have a moment like this where they need to help a neighbor out, they should do it. After the earthquake, we were almost going to start school. And we start waiting. Let's see what the Department of the Education of Puerto Rico will tell us to do. And we're still waiting. So I was like, huh, we should do something. Like today we have the students of the University of Puerto Rico teaching them about animals, sharks, and kids, they loving it. Why we have these domes is the schools are not safe. A lot of students might not even be able to graduate if, if things continue this way. Ahora va a ser bien difícil meter los nenes otra vez al aula. Esto yo lo que yo creo que esto no va a ser posible. Queremos estar afuera, queremos estar afuera. La escuela ideal que queremos nosotros la estamos montando aquí. ¿Qué necesidad tienen ahora mismo ustedes que la diáspora nos pueda estar colaborando? La comida de bebé, el pediachuar y el enchuar. Increíblemente a nosotros eh, más nos ha hecho falta y que el consumo es, es mayor en este lugar. Si alguien a mí me pregunta con sinceridad que tú necesitas, materiales de construcción. Necesitamos para esta gente que tenga su casita. For now, it's mostly the food, interior clothes like panties, bras, underpants for, for the children because they get dirty a lot and the laundries are closed and they just opened, us, opened them up this week and there's a lot of dirty clothes going around. Remember you made a wish? Yeah. I think your wish just came true. I'm so happy because she brought us some tents, some air mattresses, diapers, food for the babies. Thank you. Really thank you everybody, you know. It's for me it's an honor to have you here and it's really an an relief for me to see that there's still good people that want to help us. We're not forgotten. What's it like to come down and, and, and meet family and help them out like this? I'm honored, honored. Bring tear to my eyes. Yeah? Yeah.
When I think of Clemente Sotobelli. Extraordinary and inspiring. Arrebatarle a la ignorancia todo el poder que tiene. Eso es ser poeta. Un gran poeta, un gran luchador. He was genuinely committed to both the art form and its liberational qualities. Y no se conforme con nada nunca. Eso es ser poeta. Summer of 2019 was really intense. I am still feeling amazed. I'm still feeling surprised. I didn't know that we had that capacity in us. This, I think, has been the largest social protest in Puerto Rico ever. Uh, both in terms of numbers and also in terms of intensity, but also in terms of the variety of issues that were raised during the movement. Many struggles came together and uh, we made a good soup this summer. Uh, and I think it didn't start this summer, it comes from a, a, a lot of stories, a lot of history. I think that it comes also from the pain of Maria. Maria was a shock for us, but at the same time was a, was un abrazo, was a, a moment where we, we knew how much we loved each other. I think that what we saw this summer was a culmination of a series of a compressed and accumulative process of profound social discontent. And what was fascinating was to see three generations out of the street. efectos negativos de, de los cambios en el gobierno se han dado y se han visto afectados a una clase y yo diría que esa demostración que hubo masiva fue una expresión de la clase media puertorriqueña dejando saber su indignación por los recortes, por la falta de seguridad. Hoy les anuncio que estaré renunciando. escenario como cuando un animal usted lo acorrala, que no tiene manera donde escapar, la única manera que tiene es enfrentarse y pelear, porque no hay alternativa para correr y en ese sentido agradecemos a la gente de la diáspora que está apoyando vamos a tener que pelear mucho y vamos a necesitar la ayuda Asumo el cargo de gobernadora con la certeza de que la historia me ha traído hasta aquí sin aspiración política alguna. Politicians have to be very careful in the way they present themselves and they deal with situations in Puerto Rico because the public are not going to take things for granted. They're going to demand more information. And that's why you see a concerted effort from the political and economic establishment in trying to bring forward the message that everything is back to normal, that we have to focus on, on peace and, and uh, on a new government, even though nothing really has happened. I, I feel proud. I feel so honored of being part of that you know, millions of people walking day and night in Puerto Rico. We were able to, to do something very important for Puerto Rico and for other countries that saw in us an example. The fact that we have a center for Puerto Rican studies is something that you can't get anywhere else. I'd say it's probably the most important research resource for anyone learning about the diaspora. The Centro pinpoints 
and expresses what Puerto Ricans are all about. And the journal is unique in that it is the only journal that publishes research articles on the Puerto Rican experience. It holds our history and protects it. And without Centro, all these materials would be in jeopardy. My name is Edwin Melendez. I'm the director of the Centro of Estudios Puerto Rican. It's a pleasure to receive all our allies, to the press, para hablar de lo que está sucediendo en Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico está atravesando eh, una crisis más eh, que se añade a la, a la lista larga de, de eventos que han afectado la isla en, en décadas recientes, de la crisis económica a las inundaciones traídas por los huracanes Irma y María y ahora la destrucción que ha causado este, estos terremotos en la área sur de Puerto Rico. Es impresionante ver que a través de todo esto el pueblo puertorriqueño es, eh, se ha levantado en solidaridad, en resiliencia, unos con otros. Se han creado eh, eh, montones de comités de ayuda mutua. Eh, eh, los, los compañeros aliados nuestros en Puerto Rico que iban hacia el sur encontraron un tráfico que se extendía hasta las montañas de Salinas tratando de entrar al pueblo de Canóbana con eh, camiones, con carros, con eh, suministros para la población. Eh, las organizaciones eh, de base en Puerto Rico tomaron la iniciativa de dirigir estos esfuerzos, las iglesias, las organizaciones cívicas y el esfuerzo del Comité de Noviembre y los aliados nuestros aquí en la ciudad de Nueva York y en todo Estados Unidos es enviar ayuda directamente, como explicaba eh, Teresa, eh, directamente a esas organizaciones que afectan la población que ha sufrido los damnificados por este terremoto directamente. Es decir, que nosotros eh, como intermediarios no cargamos ni un solo centavo de administración de estos fondos, a diferencia de otras organizaciones. Más adelante, el Centro de Estudios Puertorriqueño va a ser una lista de organizaciones que están trabajando directamente en Puerto Rico, que van a ser consideradas para recibir la ayuda nuestra y de otras organizaciones en los Estados Unidos. Nuestra coalición es una coalición de voluntarios, es una coalición que se extiende mayormente en la región de Nueva York, pero se extiende a través de todos los Estados Unidos. Eh, como Teresa explicaba, hemos hecho esfuerzos para la recuperación después del desastre del huracán María y tenemos ya una, un protocolo establecido que nos permite llegar directamente a estas organizaciones. Eh, se hace un proceso de reconocimiento de estas organizaciones, se asegura que son organizaciones bona fide, no profit, nos aseguramos que tienen... Eh, eh, que tienen los certificados, pero además que tienen personal y que organizan voluntarios. Nosotros creemos en el apoyo y el esfuerzo mutuo y apoyamos organizaciones que organizan a otros a trabajar eh, de primera mano en el campo con las víctimas. Ah, sabemos que ahora hay más de 20 centros de, de asilo para las personas que son víctimas. Muchas personas no van a estos asilos y están acampando en, lo, en los montes, en las partes interiores de la isla, y esas personas son más difíciles de llegar, porque no están, no están eh, mejor organizadas. Es decir, que nuestras organizaciones de apoyo en Puerto Rico, las organizaciones que estamos apoyando, eh, tienen las iniciativas de encontrar a estas personas afectadas. Están buscando voluntarios en la salud para hacer eh, eh, ayuda de, de, de evaluaciones mentales y de ayuda de salud mental, están eh, buscando ingenieros certificados para hacer eh, evaluaciones de las estructuras que todavía la gente tiene temor de entrar. Están eh, recogiendo eh, ayuda para levantar escuelas eh, que fueron afectadas. Eh, es decir, que hay un esfuerzo eh, de la comunidad puertorriqueña de toda la isla, pero mayormente las organizaciones de base en el área sur. Nosotros estamos eh, comprometidos a ayudar a organizaciones puertorriqueñas que están tomando esta iniciativa. Otra vez, este tiempo de tristeza por nosotros en Nueva York, porque las comunidades de Puerto Rico sufren. Otra vez. Otra vez. Después de María, ahora y en esta situación. Caridades católicas. Esto, estamos con Puerto Rico, la comunidad de Puerto Rico, y también, con mucho gusto, estoy también con Comité de Noviembre y su campaña de Estoy con Puerto Rico, porque yo mismo, personalmente, he visto el trabajo bueno de comité en noviembre con las comunidades de 
Puerto Rico. So, Caridades Católicas, nosotros vamos a ayudar al Comité de Noviembre por asistir en las donaciones. Y nosotros podemos decir, porque yo mismo he visto el trabajo concreto del Comité de Noviembre. Caridades Católicas también. Estamos trabajando con Caritas de Puerto Rico, con el New York Foundry, que tiene muchos programas por los niños que están acá. Y nosotros hemos hablado con ellos y ahora se sufren. Se sufren. Y se sufren. Y prácticamente, porque puedes decir, pero también hay una inquietud, ansiedad, porque otra vez una situación mala. Quería añadir que nosotros estamos en contacto con organizaciones de base. Ellos han identificado eh, la, eh, la necesidad mayor como sitios donde puede dormir la población, eh, como catres, casetas de campaña, eh, es, eh, frisas y otros elementos para dormir eh, afuera, de, de fuera de la casa. Uh, y, y también hemos identificado eh, sitio en Nueva York con la cooperación de Diáspora por Puerto Rico, una organización local eh, a través de todo Nueva York para que se puedan llevar estos, estos, eh, eh, estos materiales, estos artículos este, físicos a estos sitios de acopio para que se puedan distribuir. El Comité de Noviembre prefiere recibir este, eh, cash, eh, dinero en efectivo que puede llegar más rápidamente a los damnificados y a las personas que están tratando de ayudarlos. Con esto abrimos las preguntas. Sí. Just, does anyone have family members in um, Puerto Rico right now? They can tell us, you know, how they're doing. And yes, um, the people um, from Guayanilla. Buenos días a todos. Mi nombre es Luis Manuel Baez. Y yo soy el presidente del Encuentro Guayanillense. En lo que está pasando en Puerto Rico, especialmente en mi pueblo, Iguánica es devastador. Yo me volví un poco loco porque no podía comunicarme con mi hermano sabiendo lo que estaba pasando en Puerto Rico. Cuando pude, lo que fue con lágrimas, él me dijo, mi hermano, yo creía que me iba a morir porque era, se tembló la tierra tan y tan fuerte que la gente lloraba. Hay gente que está, muchos se han, algunos se han suicidado, mucha gente con el sueño de, de toda la vida y perderlo en un día es devastador. So, nosotros tenemos que estar bien unidos y ayudar a Puerto Rico porque nos necesitan. Como están los hermanos en Puerto Rico y ayudándonos, nosotros también tenemos esa causa y tenemos que correr. Yes. Teniendo en cuenta lo que ocurrió con el huracán María y la ayuda federal, ¿cómo consideran y cómo califican la reacción de las autoridades federales frente a esta incidente? La realidad es que la gobernadora declaró una situación de emergencia y el, el presidente aprobó una declaración de emergencia que autoriza a FEMA a intervenir y hacer los, hacer los, los, los las evaluaciones de la situación. ¿verdad? Todavía se está recogiendo esa data. Lo que sabemos informalmente ¿verdad? es que, eh, por ejemplo, los centros de evacuación donde van los residentes, eso eh, mayormente están cor siendo corridos por los municipios, pero hay muchas organizaciones, iglesias, organizaciones de comunidad que han abierto su propio sitios para recibir las la víctimas. Ese conteo de lo que está sucediendo es bien informal en este momento. Lo que sí tenemos eh, más data es sobre la, eh, dónde han ocurrido la, la, los epicentros de los, eh, de los terremotos. Eh, esa información se está recogiendo. A nivel de política pública, eh, la Junta de Control Fiscal, que es la que aprueba los presupuestos del gobierno, aprobó unos 400 millones para que el gobierno pueda reembolsar las autoridades locales eh, en cuanto a los gastos que están teniendo. La realidad es que la capacidad del gobierno local de actuar e intervenir rápidamente ha sido afectada por todas estas cortes presupuestarios en las últimas décadas. La realidad es que una de las víctimas de, esa, de esos cortes fue la llamada Defensa Civil, que era una organización que aunque tenía eh, eh, trabajadores del gobierno agrupaba otros trabajadores del gobierno, policía, bomberos, etcétera, más voluntarios, voluntarios de la Guardia Nacional, voluntarios de la comunidad, y eso por muchas décadas sirvió para esta situación de huracanes, se activaban, limpiaban las carreteras. Eso se ha eh, extendido ahora a la iniciativa de los individuos. Eh, 
O sea, que los individuos, eh, las organizaciones de base y los individuos, eh, usted quisiera ver los carritos de hot dog llevando eh, eh, suministros a estos campos eh, y distribuyéndolos de gratis, la iniciativa privada. Eh, pero el esfuerzo coordinado ha estado rezagado por la falta de estas estructuras que existían antes en Puerto Rico, que mucha gente recuerda, y que han salido, eh, la gente sale a, con machetes a limpiar las calles, re, salen a recoger los escombros de terremotos. Pero a nivel federal, ¿cómo considera bueno, la A nivel federal, yo voy a describir lo que está sucediendo. Puerto Rico tiene 42.5 billones de dólares aprobados por autoridades federales. De eso se han recibido quizás unos 8 a 10 billones en ayuda de emergencia, en la reparación del grid eléctrico y demás. Ahora mismo eh, la, el HUD, la Housing and Urban Development eh, Department, está, está aguantando como unos 10 billones de, do, de dólares asignados a Puerto Rico en CGDR Funding. Es el fondo que se usa para estos fondos. Ha estado aguantando, ha, ha sido aguantado eh, por meses, ¿verdad? por la disputa que existe de cómo se van a controlar esos fondos en Puerto Rico. Al día de hoy todavía no se han reembolsado la limpieza después de María que los municipios eh, realizaron. Es decir, que hay un rezago en esa ayuda. De la misma forma, FEMA eh, se aprobaron unos 4 billones de dólares para mitigación que están siendo eh, eh, otorgados por el gobierno de Puerto Rico, pero hay otros 8 billones asignados a, a FEMA para Puerto Rico que están en la disputa de cómo se van a controlar esos fondos. Eh, eh, lo que estoy describiendo es una, una situación política y burocrática que está aguantando el, el desembolso de estos fondos de emergencia. Si el terremoto va a cambiar ese panorama, pues eh, es algo que estamos, que estamos esperando que suceda. Eh, y que ¿verdad? los que son más activistas en este grupo y que pueden tomar posiciones políticas deben examinar cuidadosamente. Yo creo que es tan temprano saber si hay muchos para evacuar aquí, pero sí, si lo pasa, nosotros vamos a asistir. Pero casi siempre es mejor si nosotros trabajamos con las comunidades locales para reparar, para recuperar donde las familias, donde los, los lugares familiares. To donate uh, catholiccharities.org backslash Estoico Puerto Rico and make sure that it's uh, earmarked Estoico Puerto Rico. By check uh, to uh, make payable to Comité Noviembre, write on the check Estoico Puerto Rico and mail it to uh, our office at 45 East Arts Hill. Arts Hill, New York, Puerto Rico.